The industrial towns of Milford Haven and Pembroke Dock straddle the Clethi River in rural South Pembrokeshire. Milford was planned as a port for transatlantic liners from America. That failed, but by the early 1900s, it found a new lease of life as a thriving fishing port. Pembroke Dock had been a Royal Naval dockyard since the 1840s. By 1900, it entered a glorious phase as Britannia ruled the waves. In 1900, both towns could look forward to the new century with confidence. Milford Haven as a flourishing fishing port, the fourth largest in the United Kingdom, and Pembroke Dock as an admiralty dockyard serving the greatest fleet the world had ever known. The fish market at Milford was a bustling place echoing to the sights and sounds of fish being landed and sold. Louise John was a braiding room girl she was responsible for making fishing nets and recalls those times. You would hear the ones that were selling the fish. Well, then you could hear their voices all over the dock. My brother-in-law was what you would call a packer that would go down and pack the fish and swing it, like put it on this uh, tub affair and swing it up to the top of the mark where the boys was and they would catch it and put it in boxes from the ice factory to the market. And this uh, lump of fish of ice would be coming to and going into the ships. Fishing was life-threatening work and working conditions were bad. Fred Hetherington, one of Milford's longest serving fishermen, remembers those days. Always dangerous, especially bad weather because you're pulling in the trawl, you know, the, you know what I mean now, you're, you've got the net. Well, the net is all, all coming in and you pull it in and you nip it with your knees against the ship's side, see? Well, when she rolls, she'll take that back from you. Well, if you're not careful, she'll take you as well, see? And that's how, how it was, you, you got used to it, you was like a, well, you could say like a rat, you was that, you was that much used to it. Across the Clethi in Pembroke Dock, the Royal Naval Dockyard employed over 4,000 skilled workers in a variety of trades. The people of this booming town were proud of its status. Royal yachts were built here, as well as warships for the Royal Navy, as Vernon Scott, a local historian, recounts. It built warships of every description, capital ships, uh, destroyers, cruisers, light cruisers, battleships. And uh, you had not only all these men working in the yard, but the rest of the town obviously was prosperous as well. And uh, there was uh, people walked about Pembroke Dock in those days with a jauntiness, you know, because they, they felt that they were someone, and they were. As the First World War approached, Pembroke Dock prospered. Betty Lomas, daughter of a dockyard worker, remembers waiting for her father at the dockyard gates. The road was black with there's people, you know, I mean, you're looking down off the Barrack Hill where you could see down on them, you see all these men coming out of work. Pembroke Dock was prosperous. On payday, the men found the temptations of drink hard to resist, as Trevor Rossiter relates. There was a family atmosphere in the dockyard. Father got sons in, sons got... and think, That's the way it went, all the way through. Just outside the dockyard, there was a pub called the Navy Inn. Some of the men liked the tipple rather a lot. So their wives and kids used to meet them outside the dockyard, get their housekeeping money, go home while Dad had a drink in the pub. The Haven area was further boosted by the Great War. Pembroke Dock's expertise in shipbuilding was vital. In Milford, fishing was halted and the trawlers used for mine sweeping. The area's role in the war on land and sea is recounted by historian Wing Commander Ken Mackay. Numerous volunteers joined both the uh, Royal Navy and the Army. A large naval base was established centred upon Milford Docks. 
uh, Pembroke Dock was also involved in this role and also became uh, the headquarters of an important army training uh, area. The camps outside Milford with soldiers ready to depart for the killing fields of Europe are recalled by two youngsters at that momentous time. We used to go for, from school. When they, they, they used to march back from, from uh, Hubberston then to Scoverson. See? And they'd be marching and there would be hundreds of kids passing. And the, outside of Scoverson there was nothing but uh, tents. Not in the fort. What a tent all round the Hanots. We had boys in our school that said they were 17, but they was only 16. Three of them went to the war, and one come back as the VC, Lewis uh, the VC. So our teachers in the summer used to make us go blackberry picking after school and the teachers would weigh them. Most of the mothers would come down and buy them. Some would make tarts and sell them and then they would save the money and send present to the boys. The Haven's biggest contribution was at sea. It was an embarkation point for soldiers going to France. Pembroke Dockyard also provided invaluable support for the major naval encounters of the Great War, including the Battle of Jutland. I think without any doubt whatsoever, Milford uh, was in the front line in the First World War. About 80% of the U-boat war was fought within 100 nautical miles of Milford Haven. Uh, many crippled merchant ships and casualties were taken into Milford. Uh, local doctors and various missions to uh, seamen played uh, key, key roles in dealing uh, with uh, uh, these casualties. Many thousands of soldiers and sailors who left the Haven to fight in the war didn't return, but Armistice Day was still a very joyous occasion. Yes, I can remember Armistice Day well. The Gunkel, we, we put a big fire and got trees and God knows what, all ready for, for lighting up, see? Oh, everybody was uh, joyful then. <laughs> oh, hey, aching and rockets going up, ships was putting their rockets up, and even their distress rockets was going up. And they used a lot up. Hey. After the First World War, the Haven returned to an uneasy normality. A boy then remembers the excitement of a ship launch, but it was the end of an era. I can remember going to the launching of the last ship that was built in Pembroke Dockyard. She was called the Oleander. Well, they didn't know this was gonna be the last ship. I could see Dad down in the pit where, where the keel was originally laid, and there's big blocks of wood that holds the vessel in position while they're building it. And there was men with big sledgehammers knocking these blocks out of the way. She went down the grease thing and just slid down. Wonderful sight for a youngster. But the writing was on the wall for traditional naval shipyards like Pembroke Dock. Demand for outdated warships ended and brought to a close a golden period in the dockyard's history. It closed in 1926. When the notice came, oh, the place was dead. It was like a big funeral. That's all I can remember is all these people going to meet in their husbands, coming out when the notice was given that the dockyard was going to be closed. I can remember my father coming home. He was almost, well, he was in tears. They were all, they were sh absolutely, they were terribly upset about it. Because there was not, he didn't know what else you were going to do. A large number were highly skilled men. And that skill was then removed from Pembroke Dock and other parts of Pembroke Because they were, they went to Portsmouth, Devonport Dockyard, Rosside. They even went abroad to Bermuda. Singapore to name two places. And so suddenly a thriving, bustling community was reduced to a ghost town. In the interwar period, Milford Haven flourished, unlike many parts of Wales. In the 20s and 30s, the townspeople never had it so good. Milford uh, became famous for quality fish, uh, particularly hake. And between three and four trains uh, loaded with fish 
left the port each day for destinations such as London, Birmingham and Manchester. But Milford was in its prime then, there's no kidding about it. He was never out of work. I've never been out of work in my life. People in the fishing industry had to work all hours. A braiding room girl remembers the hard work making fishing nets. It was really hard work and your hands got very sore. I can remember the first week that I went there, my dad said, she won't stay there long. I stayed a week and I had very long hair and it had to be plaited. When my hands were that sore, my mother used to pluck my hair then because I couldn't do it because of my hands. Milford people had fishing in their blood. They prospered from the 30s fishing boom, as John Springer, a boy at the time, remembers. My father, he was, he was on the fish market. I had a sister in the smokehouse, another sister with a the, with the freezing plant. And I, my mother, her sisters, all with the braiding room. And in, in fact, we was to do with fishing all the way through. I had five uncles who went to sea in the same house. They wouldn't be all in the same time, so there was paydays every day in that house alone. I know there were six pay packets going in there from, from them. For Pembroke Dock, the Second World War was a lifesaver. One of the most dramatic sights was the Sunderland flying boats, as the dockyard became an important Allied military and air base. People were proud of their town again. They subsequently built up a major flying boat base, which by World War II was the largest in the world. The largest flying boat base in the world. There were nearly 100 flying boats there. One young man had left with his family to live in London when the dockyard closed in 1926. He came back as a crew member in a Sunderland flying boat. The place was bustling. Uh, when, when I arrived, went into the dockyard, there was a Canadian squadron, an American squadron on Catalinas, an Australian squadron, and a British or RAF squadron, which not only consisted of British, there was quite a few odds and ends of different nationalities in it as well. Sunderland's a big aircraft, and it was strong, well built, built on the, on the style of a ship, and we were, we were like seamen airmen. The strategic importance of Pembroke Dock led to bombing by the German Luftwaffe. The Pennar oil tanks were hit and the town bombed. A young ambulance driver then recalls the horror of it all. Absolute devastation. It was all rubble, mess, piles of, of uh, stones and litter all over the road, glass, chimney pots, everything. We went back up the street then and Law Street had been bombed. And there was terrible devastation there. They were digging people out then. People, men running all over the place. And you wondered, well, what on earth is going on? You couldn't really believe that all this had happened. As the war intensified, a large buildup of ships for D-Day gathered in the haven. Soldiers arrived from across the world in preparation for the invasion and young boys at the time felt it was a big adventure. October 1943, the uh, United States Navy arrived here and they set up what was known as an advanced amphibious base in readiness for the invasion of Europe. And uh, this led to a tremendous inf influx of uh, Americans into the area. Final training as well for the invasion was done uh, nearby and both Churchill and uh, the Supreme Commander Eisenhower visited to check on progress. For a boy, like I was, it, it was... I don't know, this is a terrible thing to say because we're talking about a, an awful war, but it, it, was, it was an exciting time. There was a post-war boom in the fishing industry in Milford Haven and a frenzy of activity. For a young man from a fishing family, it meant that he could start his career as a fisherman with confidence. There was a big fishing fleet then. I mean, there was even trawlers coming back, what had been requisitioned for minesweeping. They were coming back. 
and being converted back to trawlers. So there was trawlers coming in all the time. Trawlers from other ports would be coming down. Uh, minefields hadn't long been opened. There was a good stock of fish there with them, like you see. The dock was like a small shanty town. There were ships being repaired, getting ready for sea. A lot of work going on at that time. When I came out in 1952, I didn't go back fishing. It was declining all the time, like, you know. With the fishing industry in decline in the late 50s, the Haven area was thrown a lifeline. International oil companies developed new sites around the waterway. Super tankers could use its deep water facility at a time when there was a need to produce ever more petrol for the booming car industry. One young man, Ashley Warlow, who lived in the quiet rural village of Rosemarket, remembers the excitement of seeing the refineries being built. From my home, I could see the uh, towers and vessels and chimney stacks of this new oil refinery that Gulf were then building at Waterson starting to appear on the horizon. I think I went down then one Saturday morning to the village shop, uh, the post office and village shop, and the postmaster was a good friend of mine. And when I bought my stamps or whatever I was buying that day, he said to me, this is the last time you'll see me here, Ash. I'm going to uh, start as a process operator in the new Gulf refinery in Waterson. He followed the postmaster, like many others, and joined the oil industry. As it boomed in the 60s, it brought high wages and also many social benefits. I think everyone wanted to get a job in the oil industry. I mean, you were proud that you were working in the industry. I mean, at Gulf Oil, we issued, uh, unlike the other companies, shiny aluminium safety helmets, not the hard plastic things. And uh, there was always a bit of one-upmanship to go home at night. And, People would leave their helmet in the window with the company logo on so they would know that they were employed in the oil industry. It was, uh, it was the place to be, I think. A whole new way of life developed around the oil industry. Uh, we were partners in the Petroleum Club. Now, that was a, a sports and leisure complex to the west of Milford Haven now that probably was the, the most prestigious sports club of its kind in, in sort of West Wales at the time. In the early 70s, the oil industry still flourished and brought important spin-offs, especially the new Pembroke Dock power station, which burned oil. It did much for the South West Wales economy and for local jobs. The area was further boosted by the relocation from Swansea in the mid-70s of the B&I Irish Sea Ferry to Pembroke Dock. It travelled to Rosslare daily, at the new Clethi Bridge in the 70s, there was a disaster before its opening. But when completed, it was also a further boon to the area. But amidst these developments, some people pined for the old Clethi Ferry. Until 1975, when the, when the Haven Bridge opened to link North and South Pembrokeshire, uh, there was a ferry service between the northern shore and the southern shore and tales abound about that ferry because they were cockle shell craft which if they had a lorry and two cars on board that was that was it i used that service for 19 years to go to work in Pembroke dock and i remember wild winter nights when uh, the sea was like pea soup on the boil in milford by the late 70s and early 80s the fish industry faced a crisis it was brought about by overfishing the Cod War, and the effects of EEC quota regulations. The decline also affected the ancillary services in Milford Docks. The industry had virtually dwindled to nothing. At one time, I mean, you had Baileys in the dry dock. I mean, they were having big cargo boats and ships in. You know, they, they was doing a good trade. There was a lot of men employed with the dry dock. And then that, that ceased as well. What were the fishing and that? If it hadn't been for the few little ships you got, you know, well, it, it would, would be nothing, you know. Well, it's, oh, it's entirely different now to, to when I was going, to, to them days. Oh, different altogether. I said different altogether. The oil industry was also in trouble. Despite investing heavily in new technology during the 1980s, the area felt the long-term effects of the Middle East War and the OPEC crisis. More efficient methods required fewer refineries, Oil companies look for deep water facilities closer to Europe. Within the mid-70s, 
there became overcapacity in the industry. Too many refineries had then been constructed across Europe, chasing too few customers. Efficient oil refining meant less surplus oil. The Pembroke Dock power station was no longer economically viable. With this escalating price in, in product uh, cost, ultimately it became prohibitive to burn oil to produce electricity in a mainstream power station. And the oil supply was decided as being too expensive and they went to alternative sources of electricity production and temporarily mothballed the power station. The late 70s and 80s saw further trouble for the oil industry and the environment. The 1978 Christos Bitas disaster caused havoc in the area. Then in 1983, the catastrophic fire at the Amaco refinery. This nightmare scenario further damaged the oil industry's image. By the end of the 80s, the fish industry was on its knees and Milford saw many protests against European trawlers. They were blamed for killing off the local fish industry. The orimulsion controversy in the 90s led to many more protests against using this new and problematic fuel. Pembroke Dock Power Station is still unused. Many saw the Sea Empress disaster in 1996 as the final nail in the coffin for the Haven. But John Deason, leisure officer for Pembrokeshire County Council, has a more optimistic view. Perversely, more people probably uh, were drawn attention to how beautiful and environmentally sensitive Pembrokeshire was through the, uh, the Sea Empress. Um, and given the success of the clean-up programme, which was quite remarkable, we're now uh, as strong, if not stronger, than we were before the Sea Empress in terms of tourism and general interest. In the late 90s, the Haven area is a major unemployment black spot in Wales. It's lost much of its industry and seen a major contraction in oil and fishing. For those who've witnessed the roller coaster history of the Haven's towns this century, now is a time of great sadness. It very much reminds me of the present day, as what I can remember of it after the closing of the dockyard. People, you know, wandering around, you know, a lot of young people unemployed, uh, the shops closing, and uh, that's just about it. It's going to take uh, a massive transfusion, major surgery, to breathe life back into Pembroke Dock. Despite the gloom, the Haven has many environmental and natural resources. The local authority, working with the European Commission, is in the process of strengthening its conservation area status. They also believe its magnificent waterway, allied to tourism and leisure, offers one major way forward. Ten years from now, I would like to, I would like to expect the Haven to be recognised as one of Europe's best locations for water sports. I would expect to see us uh, hosting even more international events than we already do. We do already provide for that, but on a much bigger level. Uh, and I would like to see ten years from now uh, an industry employing significant numbers of local people in worthwhile, meaningful jobs. Others believe the Haven's future depends on industry. Dreams of a new oil age based on the potential of the Celtic Sea and new engineering projects might hold hope for the future. Pembroke has got a very good workforce, a resilient workforce, and it's survived setbacks in the past. And I'm sure the resilience of the people is there. The 20th century has dealt cruel blows to the two main urban centres of the Haven. The dockyard gone, the fishing in decline, and the oil industry contracting. Yet there are signs of hope. The splendours of the Clevi estuary, with over 20 miles of sheltered waterway, are only now beginning to be appreciated. And next week, Clan Didno features in your century. That's Tuesday at 7.30. Coming up next, The Bill.